Hello, oh, welcome back to the House of Mystery. I'm your host, Al Moore, and this is KFNX 1100 AM Phoenix, Independent Talk Radio. Uh, today we're talking about the paranormal again, but this time we're talking with an investigator that um, kind of investigates a different angle. He's um, more into haunted objects and has had uh, well over 30 years of uh, exploration in this area. Um, John Safis. Now, thank you very much for being on the show. Oh, thanks, Al, for having me on. I appreciate it. Wow, so you've got quite a bit of experience. Now, what led you into the area of haunted objects rather than, let's say, uh, looking for ghosts? Well, I, I really do all of uh, the above. I've been in the uh, paranormal arena now for uh, over 43 years and investigate all different types of things. But a few years back, uh, I thought, gee, what it would be a cool idea to do a TV show just on uh, the haunted objects. We have haunted houses, haunted land, haunted people, and we've always had haunted objects, been collecting them for well over uh, 40 years from uh, different locations and uh, different things and had people send them to me over the course of the years and uh, several years back decided to uh, put a barn up on the property and I house all those haunted items in the barn on the property today. Wow. Uh, <laughs> how is that for uh, lifestyle? Like, are you, uh, like, collecting all these items that are haunted, does that sort of affect you or the living living by them or with them or around them? Well, there's a lot of prayers and bindings and different things that are done over the items to contain the energy or to break the energy that's associated with them. Um, I'm a very firm believer in, you know, if it's a public type of building or, you know, an area where people aren't living, uh, that's where those items should remain. And it keeps it away from people because, again, we deal with energy and we know energy can't be destroyed. So, therefore, a lot of times when we uh, come in contact with an item that might have something attached to it, it can trigger it and cause paranormal activity to occur in homes. So I always recommend to people to definitely not keep them there. Is there uh, activity in the paranormal barn where I house a lot of these things? Yes, people have a lot of different experiences. and. You know, people uh, tell me continuously about the different items that are down there that I've never talked about or really got, you know, brought out into the forefront, uh, sharing some of the information. So, again, it's one of those difficult things, Al. It's like a house or a piece of property. They really can't communicate with us. So, therefore, you know, we do everything we can as far as trying to break activity associated with them. How do you know, like when someone contacts you or um, let's say your investigation uh, and, and they're looking for some help and you go to a place, but how do you know when they're, because when they contact you, they don't always tell you, oh, I've got a, you know, a doll or a clock or something that's, that's haunting me. They don't necessarily know. Um, how is it that you find that? Well, one of the key things um, with investigating is asking, you know, many questions. And one of the uh, questions I ask of every case I get involved with, have you brought anything new into the house or did you get involved with anything? And believe it or not, a lot of times that will trigger a person's memory. Gee, you know what? Just happened to pick up this glass set, and that's just about the time framing when everything started. So that's what we'll always look for, you know, in these circumstances. Anything new that was brought in or, you know, anything they picked up from a yard sale. I mean, these are uh, typical type of questions that I do ask these individuals, you know, to see. And then when we're there investigating, you know, again, we check to see if we can get any readings off of an item or if we can get any um, uh, EVPs, electronic voice phenomena, around the items. And, uh, a lot of times I'll recommend to the homeowner, just take the item, put it out in your garage or, you know, in a building outside the house, and let's see if things calm down, if they feel it's that particular item. And if it calms down, that tells me there's a good possibility that we have something associated with it. Yeah, that's amazing. Now, you opened your paranormal museum back in 2004, right? Yes. Yep. And, and people can come and visit and, and, and see things, right? Well, I do a lot of teaching. I, I don't have it open uh, up to the public. I live in a residential area, 
but uh, I do a lot of teaching. I work with a lot of universities uh, within my area. The paranormal groups come in. I mean, you know, uh, people sometimes, you know, friends and things will stop by and, and go into the museum. But um, I am looking, hopefully, somewhere in the future uh, to get it relocated into an environment and, you know, a sort of speak storefront where I can do tours in there and do lectures and do different things so people can, you know, come to visit and look at the items, but don't touch. <laughs> <laughs> you break it, you buy it. <laughs> Is there a particular... Um, let's say criteria. So when you when you're doing investigation and you find something that's haunted, is there certain ones you choose for the museum and certain ones you don't? Like is there a selection uh, process? The, the, usually, the way I look at it is, I if, if I'm having a lot of difficulty and it's a heavy duty case, and the item is definitely associated and something's attached to it. I sometimes do make a decision to bury the item or throw it into a body of water. Uh, unless I have clergy with me or a spiritual person like a shaman or something, then I will let them make the, the choice on how they, you know, would like to dispose of it. Because again, breaking or burning an item, you gotta be very careful. If there is indeed something attached to it, it can gravitate right towards you. So there are items, but not by any particular you know, uh, circumstances uh, as far as an item, whether I will bring it back to the museum or not. You know, there are things that I definitely have disposed of over the course of the years. How do you dispose of it then? Like you're saying, uh, so, you know, here I am, I've got some, some haunted thing going on. Um, do, do I, uh, so you're saying not to burn it or throw it away? And I, again, no, uh, I definitely recommend to people not to burn it or break it. Uh, call somebody in to have it removed. You know, there's paranormal groups, you know, uh, everywhere today. So I definitely recommend if a, a person's not comfortable or call their clergy, their clergy can come in and bless it. Because, again, you know, if you, you have a family heirloom, I mean, I'm not really interested in uh, Grandma's five-carat diamond ring. You know, like, I'm just not. You know, again, that's a family heirloom, so I recommend that. You know, they have a binding or something done over it, put it in a safe deposit box or, you know, put it in a location, especially if it's not being worn or something, you know, where it, the energies aren't going to intermingle and, uh, you know, uh, cause a disturbance to transpire as far as paranormal activity. So now you're coming back in um, Destination America and yes. going to be doing... Uh, uh, more haunted collector, um, so that's pretty exciting. Well, I'm I'm, I'm thrilled about it. Again, to Destination America, um, again the the leading network out there today for all the different paranormal shows, and um, you know what's always a big chuckle with me is uh, watching uh, some of the different things they have on there, some of the different shows. Gosh, there isn't too many of the people on these shows that I haven't worked with or they're my personal friends. <laughs> so, again, you know, I, I think it's pretty cool. I, I think it's pretty exciting that, um, you know, Destination America is lining it up uh, with a lot of the uh, paranormal shows, reruns like uh, Haunted Collector is right at this point in time. You know, uh, giving that opportunity for so many people out there to see a lot of the paranormal shows that are no longer on the major networking. So, again... You know, it's uh, it was pretty exciting this past week to have it re-air and, you know, just take a look at those episodes and go, gee, wow, that, that, that's so cool. I forgot about this or I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so so for the people that haven't seen it, um, what's the show, um, kind of what's the uh, focus and what's it about? Well, what we do, what we did is, um, uh, as being paranormal investigators, it focuses around haunted items. And, you know, again, too, a lot of people say, well, gee, every episode's about uh, a haunted item. Like, yeah, it's called Haunted Collector. So, you know, we're not going to go in and uh, evaluate and look at uh, the circumstances of something if we know we're dealing with human spirit and ghost or something that could be extremely negative. We, we usually choose the cases that, you know, there's the possibility an item is associated with it and go in and investigate it you know, and uh, use those episodes for the TV show because it's intriguing, it's interesting as you're getting involved with it. You know, it's important to know your history, to do your research, to dig into it, see what you can find out. If there is a particular item that's tying in with it, how is it all affiliated? Why is it 
triggering something. That's what I find so fascinating when, when dealing with the paranormal, uh, you know, across the board, with just items, homes, or land. The, a lot of times the stories and the information and the things that you're doing as your research is going along can just lead you down a totally different path. And that's happened several different times with episodes. And, and who's your team that you've got working with you on the new series? On the, well, uh, these are reruns that are uh, on Destination America. Okay. Uh, again, Beth, uh, Brian, my daughter Amy, my son Chris, and myself for first season. Then when we were doing season two and season three, that was Jesslyn and Jason that uh, have joined uh, the, the two uh, additional seasons. So again, with, with all of that, you know, knowing all of them and being involved with them, it wasn't just uh, a TV show. Each and every one of them are involved with me on a personal level that I've known for many, many years. That's pretty, pretty cool. Well, uh, it is sometimes because, <laughs> you know, they treat me like Dad, and when one starts on me, they all start, and Dad turns around and rebels against them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's other issues there. Well, And I was noticing it, and I didn't realize this, but do you... Um, have kind of a famous paranormal aunt and uncle. Uh, yes. I didn't. I didn't realize that um, that was your aunt and uncle, Ed and Lorraine Warren. Yes, Ed, Ed Warren was my mom's twin, and um, again, I uh, was very fortunate. You know, for many many years of uh, uh, working with them, being involved with uh, some of their major cases, and um, I learned a, a, a great deal from the bulk of them. And again, you know, just mentoring on them and learning. Uh, you know, what to look for, how to look for it, the exposure to so many different spiritual people out there. You know, it was a foundation that I could have never done, you know, without my aunt and uncle uh, backing me or uh, dragging the kid along with them on some of their investigations. Oh, yeah, I'd imagine. Um, so on, on the series, was there a particular episode that really um, stays with you? Well, each and every one of them, to be honest with you, were so unique. And, uh, you know, uh, looking at it, the uh, perspective of it, it's always interesting. I mean, one that we have coming up on April uh, 26th uh, was this ale house, and it was uh, in New Mexico. And the woman was having all kinds of problems, and there were things that were occurring, and she didn't understand it. People were seeing shadow forms. Uh, the stoves were turning on and off and everything. And as we investigated, we got involved with it. We found out that, you know, the property plus uh, a couple of uh, things she had in there for decorations and, you know, things she had stored that she picked up, we found out were definitely tied in with a very big explosion in one of the mines locally to the piece of property. So we were able to uh, associate this one uh, piece of uh, memorabilia that she had that there was a tremendous amount attached with that. And it, uh, it was one of those little uh, pumps that you would press down on, and it would ignite the um, uh, the dynamite in the caves and different things. So again, there was a tremendous amount associated with it, and that took a big twist because no one even gave it a thought. No one ever thought anything about it, but we were getting a lot of activity coming from up in the attic. And when everybody was up there checking, they were able to find uh, these particular this particular item up there, brought it down, and. There was a lot that occurred that evening as we were there researching, and a lot of activity kicked up. So again, sometimes the most least expected things are the things that occur and happen, you know, in these. And I'm, you know, very excited to be able to watch that one, you know, when it comes up on the 26th. Also, um, or uh, old places, the uh, old St. James Hotel. Again. Um, going in to investigate when they have a tremendous amount of history with them, Jesse James, Annie Oakley, you know, Buffalo Bill, a lot of these different people that are affiliated with these places and from a historical perspective going in and checking out, gee, you know, they might have stayed in this room or, you know, we know they did or, you know, items or something they might have left behind can trigger a lot of paranormal activity and it makes it very intriguing and interesting to go in and investigate these places. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty cool. Um, have you had uh, experiences with dolls then? I'm sorry. A, a doll. Like, have you had any experiences with a doll? Which uh, many dolls. I have many of them in the museum. 
that uh, either been sent to me directly or we have removed uh, from a lot of different investigations. You know, and it's always interesting because you would think a doll, you know, children play, little girls play with them, and you know, there's not usually any issues. And people are often confused on why would something so innocently have energy attached to it? Because, it's it, again, it's something you wouldn't expect. You wouldn't expect a porcelain doll or, you know, a raggedy Ann doll to have something attached to it. So, therefore, a lot of times we find there's an intent and purpose with the dolls that the energy is attached to them. Or it could have belonged, you know, to someone that, you know, uh, was a, a very, uh, that was their favorite toy or that was their favorite item that they had. And dolls just seem to really be a big target for paranormal activity. Is there another item that's really surprising that you just never see, but once in a while it comes up and it's a total shock? I think it's religious items uh, of any nature. You know, in the beginning stages, it was something that was very mind-boggling because you wouldn't think anything from a synagogue, a church, or a chapel, or any of these places would uh, necessarily have uh, something negative attached to them. But... Uh, many items uh, that people have bought at auctions or have been removed from uh, spiritual locations can trigger a lot of paranormal activity. And again, you know, it's used in a positive uh, uh, attribute, if you will, uh, with these items. They're, they're done with, you know, worshiping things on a positive, but when they come into a negative, negative environment or used in a negative environment, it can trigger paranormal activity whenever people bring these types of things into their homes. I mean, Bibles, candle holders, I have religious statues, you name it. And there's a lot of different things that you would least expect to be uh, having a paranormal issue that really has some major things occurring to it. And, and you yourself, have you had uh, paranormal experiences when, well, let's say, when you were younger? Well, I, you know, again, even to this day, I still experience different things, but I view it differently. When I was younger, I used to get scared, you know, and I, I'm very open about it. You know, uh, in a learning process with the paranormal, because it's the unknown, you know, none of us exactly can, uh, you know, prove anything out from a scientific perspective, so it's a difficult thing. You know, and I come from basically uh, engineering mechanical uh background, you know, as far as the pharmaceutical uh, end of my life for many years, so therefore I always try to look for logical things, and I think um, the more you research, the more you get into things, you have an understanding that energy can never be destroyed, but, you know, it can linger, and sometimes it has an intelligence, so, you know, having experiences or having things occur, I, I don't think too much of it, Al, and people laugh. You know, because I'll watch other people around me now, you know, get excited and jump up and down. I mean, I'll still get that aha moment, but, again, it's interesting because I can look and reflect back upon that when I used to jump and I used to get scared and want to go outside that building when my uncle would look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so I turn around and basically it's almost the same thing now. I sit there and go, aha, uh -huh, put a smile on. I go, well, there's definitely something going on. I try to comprehend it and I try to understand it. I can't evaluate it, but when things occur, you know, I go, okay, what's coming down the road? What's going to happen? Is this tying in with an investigation I'm working on or is a deceased loved one trying to communicate? This is the way I perceive it these days and the way I look at it. I, I try to take everything and see if there's some type of connection with that. Now, again, you know, when uh, things are intense and you're working on heavier duty cases, you got to be more cautious and more guarded uh, when getting involved with those uh, types of things. I and mean, things are going to occur and things are going to happen. And like I always tell people, you know, I'll hear this all the time from people. I want to go out and look for Casper the ghost. I want to do this. I want to do that. But I don't want anything to follow me home. Well, that's the chance you take because you get involved with this sooner or later you're going to end up having paranormal experiences. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, you wrote a book as well, didn't you, with uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley? Yes. Uh, I wrote, uh, we have a new one that will be coming out uh, sometime this summer, uh, Haunted by the Things You Love, and my first book, Shadows of the Dark, uh, that goes into the, uh, the darker aspect of some of the cases I've been involved with, and um, 
Haunted by the Things You Love is about a lot of the items and different uh, techniques, what to look for, how to understand things, and so that people can get a better understanding of it. Because I don't think every antique out there is haunted. Or, uh, you know, yeah. uh, it's far and few in between, but we hear about it when they cause disturbances. And can you share with the listeners what one of the darkest uh, items that were haunted uh, in your past? Yeah, I have what I refer to as uh, an idol. It's a bust. Um, a young man got himself involved with practicing things in the occult on the dark end of it. And for uh, several weeks, his personality started to change. And one night, he just came down and started telling his parents that, you know, he got himself involved with stuff and it was wreaking all kinds of havoc on him. And they went up into his bedroom with him and he had an altar set up and this, like, uh, two foot statue was there. And he said, whatever I conjured up, whatever I brought in is living inside that statue now, and now it is telling me to kill myself. Well, the young man needed a deliverance and uh, several other things done over him. It was removed, and today it resides uh, in the museum. So they, they, there's a mishmash of a lot of different things, ritual items and just ordinary trinkets to furniture to jackets to you name it, and sometimes you just never know that, uh, uh, you know, end up in, in, in my barn with uh, uh, cumulative of a lot of items. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you're still doing this to this day right now? Yes, I am. Uh, I still investigate. I still get involved. Um, again, um, after all these years, it's, um, you know, uh, something I'm, I, I will always have an interest in. And I think the key element, uh, with that is that we all want those answers. We're all looking for that big question that we all have. What happens to the energy, the spirit, the soul after it leaves that physical body? Why are the communications taking place so strongly today compared to even years ago? You know, I look forward to the advancing. I enjoy playing with some of the different pieces of equipment that are out there that, you know, some of the things they came up with today to be able to uh, chart and record different things. So, yes, I'm very much involved today as I've always been. Have you ever uh, then resolved or come up with what you think happens when people pass on? Well, it's all theory. Um, I do believe that we, you know, definitely consist of energy. I believe once that energy leaves... Uh, again, you know, um, studying and being involved with so many different religions, you know, some people believe that there's a heaven, some people believe there's a hell, and that this can transpire and this can uh, occur. Some people believe living on earth is hell, so again, <laughs> you know, it, it depends on the in interpretations of a lot of different things. But I, I do feel that there's such mystery in, in, in our universe, and things that we just don't understand or comprehend. I know something occurs. I know things happen. And I do believe that, you know, uh, communications do occur and they do happen. But I just don't have those golden answers that we're all searching for. Hopefully someday before I turn into a ghost, I'll know a little bit more and hopefully maybe have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, so now on your investigations, do you ever bring a medium in or a medium to analyze an item if it's if it's sort of showing haunted? Absolutely. Um, I've had the opportunity on uh, uh, many investigations, including the TV show, uh, to work with uh, several people that are gifted. And you have to remember, I've always worked with them, Lorraine Warren, as far as I'm concerned, is a very gifted person. I'd watch her walk in cold and get more information than you could ever imagine that would tie in with something. But even to this day, I still do. I have uh, very good friends that uh, I work with that sometimes they can pick up the information and be able to help us, whether it's an item or, you know, uh, the environment or an individual that we're working with. And, and what about equipment, the scientific side? Um, do you guys use a lot of equipment? My entire team does. Yes, there's like 26 people within my paranormal group. And the horns, bells, and whistles, as I call it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, there's so many different things out there. Me, I still stick to the basics. And what I mean by that is sometimes, you know, I'll do photography work. I uh, have my tape recorder uh, usually running. Uh, videoing is an extremely important element. Um, with a lot of this, but to, uh, you know, work with a lot of groups out there, including my own team, watching them, 
you know, setting up everything, uh, the infrared and the cameras all over the place and the uh, tri-field meters, you name it, they all use it. And, you know, sometimes when activity spikes, it's really intriguing and interesting watching all the equipment go off. It really is because it's just ver verifying that there's something occurring that we can't see and we can't touch, but we're all experiencing it. So yeah. I'm very intrigued by a lot of the equipment. Oh, yeah. Is, is there a certain location or a place that you love to go and investigate, even though you've been there before? Gettysburg. Oh, okay. Um, Gettysburg, uh, I, I've been going there for as many years as I could possibly uh, remember. I continuously, uh, I'm always intrigued each and every time I go down there. It's a very unique type of uh, place, but most battlefields are, but uh, Gettysburg is just... One of those unique types of places where uh, it's interesting to watch people, to have experiences for the very first time, because um, if anything's ever going to happen on a paranormal level, it's Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Hmm. So you, is it about the feel, or just because there's just so much going on, so much activity? I think it's a combination of uh, several things. Um, anywhere where, where there's a tremendous amount of tragedy, I do believe that you know energy can linger and it could stay there and people coming in that are sensitive or uh, us, we're like batteries. And, you know, when we go into these locations, you know, we get all hyped up and, you know, more energy get thrown, gets thrown off of us. So, therefore, I do believe that, that, you know, that possibility, that energy connection could take place and you can have a paranormal experience. And a lot of the buildings down there are uh, definitely haunted and there, there, there's a lot that transpires and does happen. Does anything ever stay with you? Like, do you end up having dreams yourself or, or things that you take home after investigations? Well, I definitely feel that, you know, again, uh, tying in with, with any of these types of uh, things. You know, just talking now about the Revolutionary uh, War, uh, May 3rd, we will be doing an episode where a young man, um, you know, uh, was having experiences, and he kept feeling like he was in the battles, and he had different things occurring with him, and this kept happening and happening. We found out that the house was built on a piece of property down in uh, Maryland where um, there was, you know, one of the battles. So a lot of these things do connect, regardless of whether it's an old building or a new building, energy can, you know, uh, hang around. I try to always explain things as, as so that everybody can comprehend it and can cause certain individuals to have uh, paranormal experiences. So I would definitely say yes. And, and I have to ask, now, items like uh, Ouija boards, uh, mm -hmm. did you find there any uh, more, let's say, um, I don't want to say evil, but any more possessed than other items? Like, do you, do you fear them, or do you, are you cautious with them? Well, I'm very cautious, in, in all fairness. Um, again, Ouija, the Ouija board is nothing but a game. And it's not the board, it's not the planchet that brings the spirit in, it's us with the individuals. We're the catalysts. So, you know, when certain individuals play it, they end up opening up the door to the spirit realm to establish communication. And sometimes that energy attaches to these boards, just like pendulums or tower cards or anything. Energy is going to attach to it. Therefore, you know, the Ouija has become very popular with, you know, being one of the devil's tools, so to speak. But again, you know, um, I have many of them in the museum that have been uh, uh, removed from investigations. We worked on one case where, uh, again, um, that's an episode that uh, uh, the young man was playing with the Ouija and started all kinds of problems, and uh, it ended up getting broke in the house and causing more problems within. But again, um, when it comes to that, then, uh, I could have probably a good 100 Ouija boards today in the Paranormal Museum. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. Um, it's just crazy the amount of uh, um, attention the Ouija boards have got the last little while with the movie and everything else like that. Mm -hmm. So is there a place that you'd love to investigate that you haven't been to yet? Oh, gosh, there's, they, they, there's so many. You know, everybody thinks uh, I, I've been just about everywhere, but, you know, again, there's just so many locations out there. There's battlefields and historical places I've never been. I'd love to go to Egypt, Greece. You know, just to check some of those types of uh, locations out, you know, to see what the activity is like. So, I mean, 
the, the, my uh, wish list is very, very long still. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, hopefully you get enough time to do it all. Well, you, you always hope. You hope things pull together and uh, those opportunities you know, present themselves and you, you get that opportunity to go to uh, some of the different locations. You always hope for it. Do you feel that there's a difference uh, country to country? Like if you're in, in England or in Canada or Australia and investigating, do you feel there's a difference in the yes. cultures, like how they perceive things? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I've spent uh, time over in England and Scotland and Ireland uh, years back, and their view and the way they handle the paranormal has always been uh, extremely different from us. They try to comprehend it. They try to understand it. Um, again, a lot of the buildings are, you know, a lot older than what we have here in the U.S. So, again, um, watching and understanding the way they talk about it. I mean, over there, you know, it's uncommon not to have something in your house or in your building. Uh, so, again, they embrace it and they look at it probably a lot more openly and differently uh, than we do here. Now, again, I, I, I have to say, in, in regards to, you know, so much that's transpired over the past several years as far as TV shows and movies and things, we're catching up. You know, people are more taught, people talk more about the paranormal today than they used to. You know, people were afraid, they didn't want everybody to think they were cuckoo. You know, so I always, do, if the one thing I find interesting is um, having someone walk up to me that's 80 or 90 years old and just start telling me about a ghost story and they feel so much better because they were never allowed to talk about it and they could finally let it out and people won't think they're crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it's true, it's true. It's our, our thought of as evil, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you think there's a reason for that, like why the U.S. is so, let's say, behind or uh, as, let's say, Europe? I feel it has a lot to do um as far as, you know, the newness, if that makes any sense to you. You know, we're, we're, we're a baby country in comparison to a lot of the other uh, countries out there. You know, when you have buildings that are eight, 900 years old, and, you know, people are accustomed to it. We're over here, like I said, over the past several years, it's being viewed a lot differently now and uh, comprehended a lot differently. And we're a culture here in the U.S., where we need proof. We, that, that, that's us. That's just the way we are. We like our tangible proof. We want to know if something exists. And we like our quick answers. You know, that, that, we just view everything. So even between the U.S. and Canada, there's even a huge difference as far as culturally uh, the way they view the paranormal in comparison to the way we do here in the U.S., but again, I think it's because we, for so many years, have strived for wanting that scientific proof. And, uh, you know, uh, again, it, it, we're catching up. We're catching up. That's one area I definitely say that we're catching up on these days. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And so do you think that the uh, TV shows and, and the media and sort of th things like that have been good for the paranormal community? Yes. Yes and no. Um, with it, you know, people have to understand, you know, it's entertainment. People aren't going to sit there and watch nothing if you're just sitting there doing EVPs and just, you know, uh, staring and just taking photographs. You know, there could be hours and hours of filming that take place and that has to get cut down into a little episode. So, therefore, you know, sometimes you could be on the location for some time before you get anything. But, you know, for that half-hour segment, they're going to take the parts where, you know, the, the most activity is occurring or there's uh, something that's transpiring so that people are going to be interested in watching the shows. You know, I just, but it's like anything else. I, I don't look at our field uh, any different than anything else. You always get criticized and you got people that like it. You got people that are going to say, you know, you're doing things on a negative level. So, again, just like anything else, but I, I feel it's a double-edged sword. It's opened up a lot made people reach out and on the other hand it's you know caused a lot of uh criticism yeah uh, so but you think it's going in the right direction well to advance you have to keep pushing forward you know and um a as you do move forward you know you're going to have stumbling blocks and different things so yes i think we're on the right path you know we're moving forward uh, uh we're getting some of the information out there 
So, you know, again, I look at it from that way, and I often look back, you know, like I said, uh, over the past several years, it's just uh, a phenomenal, the amount of people that get interested in the paranormal and investigate in comparison to years ago. Yeah, yeah. And and so where do you see yourself going next? Well, um, actually, I'm heading down to Gettysburg this weekend. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> you know, um, uh, you know, continuously, you know, um, uh, involved with different cases and different things and working with different people. So, you know, within a week's time, uh, you know, I could be in Connecticut one day and the next thing you know, I could end up in another state or something. So uh, it's not an unusual for me, you know, to uh, continuously be on the move or doing things or getting involved with things, lecturing or going to campuses or, you know, all of the above. Yeah. So this is your full-time life? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, several years back, and when we all went through that big hurdle, you know, to, with everything crashing, I got laid off uh, from working full time and decided at that point to take a, a chance at lecturing and, you know, being involved with it. And, you know, that's uh, basically what I do. Again, I was older. I worked 30 years, and, you know, I was already uh, pretty much established where I was able to take that chance at that point and, you know, just be able to go out and lecture and do uh, universities and colleges and things. And so you really enjoy doing the lecturing and, and seeing people live like that? I love it. I, I love being with people. I enjoy uh, very much uh, the interaction with people. That, that to me, is something that I've always enjoyed. I always will. Um, the, it, it's an important element because today we've gotten to be so... Uh, so much social media, you know, just going on the Internet or texting and everything that, you know, it, it's a very key element, you know, uh, to still get out there, socialize with people, talk to people and uh, do those things and, you know, still bring uh, things back to TV, you know, even though they've been off the air for a few years or something like that, bringing back um, the uh, TV shows, uh, people enjoy it. And uh, a lot of times people just say, hey, you know, I didn't catch this the first round, or I didn't see this in you know that show or that, this show. I hear that continuously from a lot of different people. So again, it's, uh, I look at uh, everything as um, being able to have that opportunity to be able to gain knowledge. And so now your um, haunted collector will be seen on which nights and what's the time? It's Tuesday evenings on Destination America at uh, 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time and 8 p.m. Central Time. And there's several very good episodes coming up, and I'm looking very forward to seeing them because some of them I haven't seen in quite some time either. <laughs> yeah. Or now, are you? How many are they going to show? Are they going to show quite a few of them? Uh, I honestly couldn't tell you. We're on season one right at this point, and um, I don't know, you know, <laughs> whether they're uh, showing season two or, or season three. I'm not quite sure at this point in time, but. Like I said, the kids and I are just uh, happy that uh, some of them are back on and some of the items that they're talking about and being on a uh, network and being out there with a whole bunch of my other friends. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> exciting. How, now, how do people get a hold of you if they have uh, something that they feel is uh, haunted? Uh, very easily, just johnsoffice.com and it takes you into all my different websites that are out there, my email address and how to contact me, um, very acceptable, accessible uh, as far as email and, you know, people uh, just calling me up on the phone or uh, talking to me. And, again, that that is one of the, the easiest ways to get a hold of me. Well, it's certainly been an enjoyable uh, conversation. I, I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I did, too. show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well... Good night. This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. I'll be back.